brought to you by Brass and Unity. We make wearable conversation starters. Our new Buddy Check packs are available now. Grab one and check on one of your closest buddies. They may need it now more than ever. Go to BrassandUnity.com, use the code UNITY, and get 20% off. And let's all heal together. And brought to you by Combat Flip Flops. Bad for running and even worse for fighting. Combat Flip Flops are your ticket to the unarmed forces by providing you with military-inspired quality footwear for men and women. To help support the podcast and in support of women in developing countries, head over to CombatFlipFlops.com and become a part of their unarmed forces today. Be sure to use the code UNITY at checkout and get 25% off. And brought to you by GFDA. Good fucking design advice. The voice in your head and the foot up your ass. GFDA makes prints, drinkware, and apparel for people who want to do their fucking best. Go and use the code UNITY and get 10% off now on anything on their site, including our collaborative product, Fucking Help Somebody. And brought to you by Daisy May Hat Co., the custom hat company based in Nashville, Tennessee. They make custom one-of-a-kind hats from wide-brimmed fedoras to cowboy hats. All of their hats are 100% beaver felt, and it's the highest quality hat you can get. They also have the coolest shirts ever. You can use the code BRASS at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Go and check out daisymayhats.com. Embrace the fever. Live the dream. Hey, you. Have you checked in with yourself today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Have you had enough water? This is your midday check-in, brought to you by Midday Squares. Big breath in. <sighs> I'm back at it. Okay. Can I tell you that you're an absolute badass? Why do you say that? It's just everything about you, the way that you're pursuing what you're doing, and just, I don't know, it's just everything about your essence is incredible to me. So I'm, I'm, well, just, I'm actually very honored to be here today. Wow, that coming from somebody like you, Fez, means everything. I got to tell you, since we're recording and everyone else heard that, so you can never take that back now, by the way. <laughs> that is like forever oh. in, in my life, which I'm going to yeah. hold so close. Um, what's really crazy is I, I try to explain to friends and people that I start to become friends with about how I roll and how that is, is I believe that we're on this planet for a certain amount of time. And I learned very quickly that I never, ever want to not say exactly what I'm thinking to someone for any reason, whether that's because they might feel uncomfortable or because they're not sure how to perceive something. So I just put it all out there. And the other day I sent you a message because um, let me preface this with, I did ayahuasca again recently in Peru and, um, I know you were just at burning man. So we're going to get, oh, we're getting into all the nitty gritty today, but I had a download happen and it happened because of you actually kind of kicked it off. I was, I asked you in a text, I said, Hey, can you send me a couple photos, um, just for your cover art? And I want to get that going. And you sent me three photos. You sent me one of you. And then you sent me one of you on a private plane holding the NBA championship trophy. And you sent one of you dunking like a machine in, during an NBA game. And it hit and it hit for a moment. And I realized, wow, just, I even get emotional talking about it now because something I learned in the ceremony was so much gratitude for those I have around me and the people that give space for me in their life. And I send you this huge message and I do this often where I feel, I, I feel a lot. And then I just kind of put it out there and then I go, oh my God. <laughs> Oh no, that might've been so intense for someone. But the thing that I learned is that, you know what, that's okay. I would rather say everything I mean when I get the chance to say it than feel like I've never got the chance to say it. And just in case I never get that moment again. And I want to say, you know, just being, being in your presence is, is a blessing because of the caliber of human and the work you put into your life. We've lost so many people recently. We keep losing people at an astronomical rate and those people's lives are worth something. But for some reason, our society is struggling with acting like that. And you have utilized the gifts you've been given by God and so many around you to support you. And you really ran with it and you did not 
you did not stop. You went until you were the best at something. And it is a beautiful thing to be around people of your caliber. So thank you for that, my friend. So when you say people of my caliber, right? Mm -hmm. I immediately start to think in my mind because it's so interesting. I think in this world, I actually got into a conversation uh, about this with a friend of mine who is a public figure as well, right? And the the conversation was around the this idea that we're still the same people that, you know, it's just over time, people start to appreciate our works, our art, the sport that I'm playing, whatever it is, right? And I love the way you started that sentence because there's people whose lives we've lost. And sometimes people don't understand that every life counts for something. What I want people to understand from listening to my story, and this is the reason why I tell the story, is yes, I was able to win an NBA championship, but you have to understand where I started, people didn't think I was worth that. Nobody thought I was worth that. And the idea is, it's not for other people to see the light inside of you. I don't care who you are. Like, it's never been for anybody else to see. The vision was always yours to, to receive and for you to manifest. And so my life is only a testimony of, or a testament rather, to what it looks like if you give a young African kid just an opportunity. I got it through the, the game of basketball, but I also want other people to get it through whatever venues that they need to make their dreams come true. And that's why I wanted to talk to you so bad. You know, when you and I connected through Neil and Ruve McDonough, which everyone knows I talk about them so much, um, they really were um, um, people that came to me in my life and gave me an opportunity in the same way that you've just been given and you were given an opportunity. And when we connected and we got to sit down and talk about my story, something that I had to hold myself back from was just, just completely bulldozing your interview and being like, no, 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 no. You, I want to know everything about you because mm -hmm. that exactly what you said is why it's so important to hear your story because if we can show others that you just need an opportunity and most of the time people when given that will run with it and that's why i was like you got to come on man because i need to, i want to dive in i want to dive into the way you are because you think differently you move differently and you vibe differently and i think that comes from your childhood and what you've been through so let's if you're comfortable let's just dive right in you my friend like you said, you're born and raised in Africa and Nigeria. You grew up in a very unlikely place to become an NBA player. And um, I really want to understand how did this happen? How does somebody get to America and become an NBA champion when it really feels like that was kind of at odds for you? That was never the goal. That was never the plan. I grew up in Nigeria. My, uh, my family, um, humble family, but dad was a, you know, he's a distributor. My mom was a distributor for alcohol. Um, he did haulage. And my mom was, um, she owned a school. She was a lawyer initially, and then she owned the school. And so my family, for some reason, there's something about Nigerian families. They push you academically, right? They have to make sure that you're indispensable. So the three options, and this is a very common stereotype for anybody who knows Nigerians, you can ask them, they'll tell you this. <laughs> doctor, lawyer, engineer. Those are the only three options that you have, right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer. If you want to be freaky with it, you maybe be an architect, but Ooh. doctor, lawyer, engineer. Everything else, you're a failure, you know? So <laughs> I say this because like arts and sports were never the thing that were pushed in my life. You know, I was kind of a chubby kid. I was a nerd. I was focused on becoming a doctor. That was my my goal. I'm the first son. I'm the first of five. So I had to lead this charge. One of the, they pushed me academically. I said that before. But what you don't know is I graduated high school at 14 years old. And so that was because what? I was really, really, that was like, I was on this fast track that skipped few grades because I was always fast. I was ahead. My mom was somebody who pushed me as well. I didn't go to her school, but um, just having that background at home and understanding the, the people who understood the, the value of education, you know, that was very, really important for me. And 
after I graduated, I could have gone to college in Nigeria. But the situation at the time was really rough. I was losing a lot of friends. There was a lot of um, just things weren't safe. It wasn't safe back home. Um, people were joining gangs. Um, I lost some friends. Some of my best friends were killed. And uh, there was just a lot of things happening. And so my family thought it'd be best to send me to America. I've actually never told anybody that story about my friends, losing friends and things like that. I just tell people that my family sent me here to be a doctor. But the background is, is that. And it's just because you put me in that state to start off is like understanding what it does to lose people and how that changes you. I felt like I got a second chance at life when I moved to the United States. Um, I have friends who went to prison. I have friends who went, who died. I have, um, I also have friends who moved out of the country as well and are doing different things all over the world. So, um, and I also have some friends who stayed and also doing good things. So uh, I don't want to say it like Nigeria is all bad. I just felt like, you know, my folks felt like for me at the time that it was important to give me the best opportunity they could. So they sent me to Yuba City, California. By That's yourself? The that is. Yeah. You, so they just like, so So how old were you when you left? Ultimately, did you like, ultimately, did 14. you actually? So you left at 14. Yeah, and by this point... Me. You're six foot 11 at this point because. No, at 14, I'm six four. Okay. Six that's four. also just ridiculous. <laughs> um, we'll start with that. So they said, okay, you're going to America. Did you have family in America? My uncle, I moved into, I moved in with my uncle. Okay. So you came to America, you went to California, you're 14 years old. And yeah. did you, I'm assuming because your parents are very intelligent individuals, English, you, you spoke English, no problem. Well, we speak English in Nigeria. There's 250 different dialects in Nigeria. So if we didn't speak English, then nobody. That's would know why I'm on. never sure. Yeah. Well, cause I never know. I have, I have a few friends that are, that live in Kenya, that live in Uganda and the dialects change from different places. So I'm like, what yeah. is the basis here? So I'm just wanting to make sure I know what I'm looking at. Okay. Yeah. So English spoke, 14. English. And yeah, no, I moved here because my uncle, that's my mom's brother. He is a doctor. I was an aspiring doctor. So they sent me here to live with him. He was in Yuba City, California. By the way, Yuba City, California is not on the is not really on the map when you're leaving Africa and you're thinking about your goal. <laughs> you're thinking about crossing the water to America. You think about everything that you've seen on TV. You think about New York. You think about LA. You think about maybe San Francisco, Chicago, Las Vegas, Miami. These are the things that we see on TV. And this is these are the representation that you have of America outside America. Okay. So I flew to New York. That was my first stop. I had some family there, spent a few oh. spent a few weeks with them. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Flew to San Francisco from there. Wow, this is incredible. Drove through Sacramento. Okay, wow. We just kept driving, and I'm like, okay, all right. All I see now is just farm, just farmland everywhere. Oh, no. And this is where I ended up, in Yuba City, California, in farm town, like, just middle of kind of nowhere at the time is what it felt like, and it still kind of feels that way. And this is where my uncle chose to reside, and this is where my journey began. And... I will try to make this story short because it's very complicated and very long. But my uncle at the time, who um, who knew nothing about the sport, he suggested, he was like, oh, why don't we try to get you to play basketball? Because that could help pay for your education. Not a bad okay. idea. All right, how do we go about doing this, sir? <laughs> so he finds a basketball team on the back of the newspaper. <laughs> Oh, this is local good. team and um this was my introduction to the game right so we we showed up one day random i think they had tryouts we showed up and they were like trying to teach me the game and whatnot his long term well his his goal his plan was okay you're 14 years old you're about to turn 15 years old all right you have people usually go to college here at 18 19 years years old so how about you use that time instead of going to college right now, you're converting the money from Nigerian money to the dollars. It's just Naira is our currency. It just wouldn't make sense for us to pay for college. 
like for your parents to pay for college. So if we get you to play basketball, maybe then you can pay for college and then we can figure it out from there and you can go on and be a doctor. Well, this plan was for me to go back to high school. So here's what, here's the part of the story that I love, because I think sometimes people miss, people want to hear the big things that happen in somebody's story, but sometimes it's the little things that add up. So I had to go back to high school to go forward. And initially, like even some of my best friends from high school called my parents, like, why would you send him back to high school? He had amazing grades, just send him <laughs> to college so he could, because they felt like they were punishing me. Oh, right? okay. And it was this amazing, like, and, and granted, the plan didn't work out that way, right? Because I ended up going to the high school. The high school was Jesuit High School in Sacramento. I got cut from the high school team because I just wasn't good enough. I was okay. very uncoordinated. I was, I didn't know the rules. Matter of fact, the first time we ever played in a tournament, I scored against my own team. It was like all these things. Okay. Compounded. <laughs> like I said, this story is wild, you know? Mm-hmm. So you can go ahead and laugh. It's okay. No, I'm Get I'm enjoying out. myself. I'm <laughs> taking my notes. I'm laughing here. I'm blown away by this a little bit because you don't often hear this. You hear like, a, I trained as an athlete my whole life. I went as a kid. My parents introduced me to sport young. I, you're, it, it feels like that, that saying, sometimes you need to go five steps backwards to go seven forward. So. Yeah, but it doesn't, it, it's as good as that sounds, it is a hard thing to go five steps backward. It's, 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 it feels embarrassing. Like your ego takes a huge shot. You feel like you're not good enough when you're taking five steps back because you're also watching everybody else move forward. Everybody I went to high school with was in college. They were all moving on and, and doing things in their lives and I was going back to high school. Now, even not only am I going back to high school, the mission that I went back for didn't work out. So now what am I What am I doing? Like, what is really the plan now? So um, I end up, um, I met this guy. Before I leave the high school, I met this guy and it's also a funny story. So he's walking, he's he's a father of a student that was coming to the school. And he comes to the school, he's with the coach. So he's walking around there, he's getting a tour of the school. And so he sees this big kid, he sees me sitting waiting for my ride after school. I was waiting because I had allotted that time because I thought I was gonna be a part of the team. So when mm. they were so that was practice time after school was over. But since I didn't make the team, I still had to wait for my ride now. So I'm just sitting around and he sees me and he's talking to the coach. He's like, man, you guys are going to be really good this year, right? The coach says, yeah. He's like, man, you got a big kid over there. You guys are going to be. He's like, yeah, that kid is no good, though. He's not going to be on the team. Okay. What's wrong with him? Can he run? And I only know this part of the story because he, tell, he told me this part of the story. He said, what's wrong with it? Can he run? The coach says, yeah. Can he jump? Coach says, yeah. Then what's the problem? He can't play basketball. That's <laughs> the problem. Uh, that's a pretty big problem. Um, so he says, yeah, okay, can I have him? The coach says, do whatever you want. So he comes and he introduces himself to me and he says, listen, I have the summer AAU program, which at the time I didn't know what it was. AAU is summer travel basketball Kids go around the country, they play against each other, right? It's different leagues. So I want you to play for my team. I just got released. I just got cut. They already told me I'm not good enough. I'm just like, yo, like, I'm not really interested. Plus, you're a stranger. I don't know you. you know? Stranger I'm, danger. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, at the time, I even, like, but he, like, convinced me. He was like, dude, listen, I got you. You just got to, you just have to be patient. You have to work hard. I will be there to guide you, whatever, whatever. So I'm excited. He's got me hyped up now. Like somebody who kind of believes in me, right? So I wait till I get home and I had to call my parents back in Africa. So I wait till midnight, nine hour difference. So I call my family. Hey, this this guy I met, da, da, da. he's going to be, we're going to be traveling all over playing basketball. Like who, who is this person? Do you know him? No, but he says we can travel to get, my parents damn near hung up the phone. Like, what are you talking about? Dude, this is how people get kidnapped. This is how you could be a pedophile. You have no idea. Come to find out that this guy was kind of an, you know, an angel in disguise because you just have no idea. Like if you have this 
this thing, right? Like whatever it is that you're supposed to do in your life. I feel like God, if anybody believes in God or whatever, like I feel like the universe, God conspires to make that thing happen for you. You kind of have to trust it. You have to be a good person. You have to work hard. And so he was one of those people that came into my life. After a while of trying to figure out who this person is, they eventually signed me up for his AAU team. This is where my first basket was against my own team because uh, we were playing the tournament and I didn't know the rules. I didn't know that at halftime you switch ends of the court. Okay. Well, that makes so sense. Get the though. ball. Yes and no, right? Because, you know, it's really basic rule. <laughs> but, but this is where I started. And I love telling the story this way because it's very embarrassing. Like as much as you think you understand what it feels like to be in that position as a 15 year old kid, when that happens to you, people are laughing at you. Adults are laughing at you. People are telling you, get, get that dude off the court. Like it's, there's no way for me to properly tell you what that story or what that feeling was. But what really happened in that moment, that was the biggest thing for me was the same man, Keith Audister is his name. He comes and he puts his arm around me and he says, listen, it's going to be okay. It's all right. We knew it was going to be, a, you, we knew you were going to be a work in progress from the beginning. But what I will tell you is that everybody in here is going to be asking you for tickets someday. You just got to trust me on this one. In this moment, I'm embarrassed. I'm shy. I don't even know. I don't even want to go back on the court anymore because I don't even believe in me. But here is a stranger. At this point now, he's turning into a father figure for me. Somebody who tells me to believe in myself. Or he believes in me, rather. And so what I learned from that part of the story, too, is sometimes you're not going to believe in yourself. Sometimes you need to kind of borrow faith from other people. You need to borrow other people's belief in you and just hold on to that for, for the times where you're struggling. You know, and I did. And... After I left the high school, this is in the summer. So I'm playing this summer ball. During the regular season, I am at a junior college. Uh, and this is during the school year. I went to a junior college because now, since I can't go to the high school, because the basketball plan doesn't really pan out. So I go to a junior college. And my goal is I can get a scholarship academically, right? So I'm in school. I'm really training and training i'm really like studying my my tail off while i'm at the school i run into the college coach over there i'm at a junior college i'm six i'm at 15 or 16 years old i think i'm 15 years old i'm at a junior college and the college coach sees me he's like dude where did you come from he's just like at this point now i'm like six seven right and he's like yo where did you who are you where did you come from please come join my team and I'm like, dude, I can't play. Do da, 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 da. So he invites me over to watch. And he watches me on the court. And he's like, okay, you do definitely need a lot of work. That's for sure. But we came up with this plan. I would be able to practice with his team if I was the video guy of the team. Perfect. I was a video guy. for So during the school year, I was the video guy of the team and practicing with the team. And then the summer, I was playing AAU with the other guy. And two years of this, like I said, I got to give you the short version. Two years of this, and I am top 150 kids under 18 in the country. Snap. Look what a little belief and faith can do. Oof. So it, it really, like, as much as I say... I, I tell people like hard work, motivate, be motivated and to do all the things and be a good person. Like there is something about fit, about just I, honestly being lucky, you know, and I feel like I was favored. So I had these people come into my lives, into my life, and they were an inspiration for me to be able to get scholarships to get to college. But even then, I still wasn't good enough when I got to college. I had to start over, right? So when I get to college, everybody's good in college, right? I'm only good enough to earn the scholarship and be a practice player in college. So it's it's actually insane because people think like once you make it, oh, you've made it. Well, right. that's never really the case, right? You make it and there's a new, like I, I was listening to T.D. Jake speak and he said the 
the reward you get for winning your last battle is your next battle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, God, that is the most accurate. I've never heard someone say that before. But as soon as you said that, I was thinking, I'm like, oh, my. That is painfully accurate. Wow. That's, that's that's what my journey was. And so when I started in college, I was a practice player. And a few moments of this for me. So the reason why I chose Vanderbilt University is which it was just where I went. Um, I had a few other places I wanted to go, but I chose Vanderbilt for a few reasons. Um, I'm still Nigerian, so academics is number one, <laughs> top 15 school in the country. Uh, number two is an up-and-coming basketball program. And number okay. three... Like, I just really, I wanted to see the South. I wanted to see something else. I wanted to see another part of America. I thought Nashville was incredible, right? Um, but the basketball part was even more important because I took a visit to the school and the coach said to me, he said, if you come here, I won't recruit over you. I'm going to turn you into a basketball player. You just have to believe in me and you got to know that I'm going to push you. Nobody really ever said anything like that to me before this point. And he wasn't scared to tell me that he was going to push me because when you're on your visit and you're getting recruited by different teams, they tell you all the nice stuff. They show you the nice things like, oh, my God, we're going to treat you like a prince the whole time. He said, listen, you need work. And I can't promise anything, but what I will promise is that I will bring out what is inside of you, but it's going to take a lot of work. And when he said that to me, I don't really know if I'm a glutton for punishment or <laughs> if I was just really excited to get out what was inside of me. But when he said that to me, I got really excited and I said, yes, let's go. And I was a practice player. And even though I was super excited when I first thought, I thought this was a great idea. When you're a practice player and you're getting your ass kicked every day in practice and you don't know what's going on. You're getting yelled at and cussed out and made to run sprints all the time. It sucks and it's hard. And there are a lot of tears and there's a lot of moments where I wanted to quit, especially when the next year I'm still not playing at all. The next year after that, I'm still playing like five minutes a game. I'm like, when is this going to do? It's not even worth it for me. I'm pre-med. I'm doing all this work in school. And then I got to come back to practice and do all this stuff. This is too hard. Yeah. And then the next, the next thing after that, which is crazy because I remember this conversation with one of my coaches one time when I was like, dude, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. And I tell, I tell the story in terms of basketball because I want people to understand basketball is just a metaphor for life. Of course. Right? There's a whole bunch of other things that happen in my life, but this is what I want to focus on because I want people to understand this metaphor because a lot of times you are on the verge of breaking and you're on the verge of quitting. But what you don't understand is two more steps to get to the next thing that you're waiting, that you've been working for this whole time. And so I told the coach, I want to quit. And I said, I don't want to do this anymore. And he says, you have no idea what you have inside of you. You know the reason why I'm so hard on you? Because I, I was like, dude, I'm tired of this. This is too much. Dude, you are picking, at this point, you're just picking on me because the level of the difference between what I have to go through and what everybody else is going through is, is too much. You make me run double. You make me do all these things. Like, why do I have to keep going through so much? You already know I'm trying to, I'm still trying to adjust to school and life in America. Like, I'm still, like, I'm trying to adjust to this game. Why are you not seeing that I'm really working as hard as I can? And he said something to me that was really, really, like, it really changed a lot of things for me. Because at the time, I just saw it as you're picking on me. Mm -hmm. The coach said, if I didn't believe in you, I wouldn't even care. That's I right. wouldn't care to keep pushing on you, to keep pushing you, to keep picking on you, to keep telling you that you can be great. This is what I'm doing. If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't even care to do any of that. And I was like, damn, can you Ooh. care about me a little nicer though? <laughs> can you just like show it a different way? Uh... Maybe a hug? <laughs> anything other than Every this once in a while, you know i like hugs too you know but right it's funny because the next year after this conversation i was team captain i was the our conference you know all conference player i was 
now a projected NBA player. Now you start seeing my name in the newspapers and all the things. And people were asking, where did he come from? Because the year before, I was just playing like five minutes a game. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always say these stories this way because people like, you have to understand that like nothing great that you ever see comes without hard work, comes without hardships, comes without adversity, challenges. And really just this innate perseverance this like you have to really believe that this is something that can happen for you mm -hmm. and along the way I, I was maybe about to lose faith and I had to borrow faith from other people you know and for anybody out there who is feeling like they don't understand that they like they don't know why their journey is going the way that it is sometimes you just got to surround yourself with people that believe in you and you just got to keep going just a little bit more. Take one more step. And that one more step for me was my senior year. So I was a junior. After my junior year, they're like, yo, he could leave right now and be in the NBA. I don't like, I hate losing. If you understand anything about me, you understand that I love, I love to win. I love to work and show and have my work show. Um. Part of the reason why I, I started to get good in college is because, like, I just I, I wanted to be good so badly. Like, I used to hate getting my my tail kicked every day in practice. Like, I used to get my like the whole my whole freshman year, I got my t every game. Like, I used to get my like me and my friends actually laugh about this now because my sophomore year, halfway through the year, something changed. I don't really understand what happened. They were just like this is kind of crazy. Like this dude, all of a sudden now in these games that we used to win so easily, now they're winning some. Now we're winning some, now they're winning some. After a while, by the end of the year, I was winning it all. And so when I got to the junior year, all the things that were practiced in the dark came to shine in the light. And people were like, where did he come from? Matter of fact, there's an article on my computer right now. I still remember from 2012, or 2011 the title was how did I get here the journey about my life because I like it just happened so quickly it's what it felt like but really like I was in the journey so it was a lot of years um that is how I became an NBA prospect and the story keeps going from there dude it's so nuts to hear it <clears throat> come from you because there's this perception that it just happens or that you, you know, somebody, or you could be kind of good at a sport and, you know, you get seen by the right coach, you get seen by the right school. And in America, it's very different, you know, for athletics versus Canada. I mean, we don't have the type of football teams. We don't have the type of basketball teams that America has when it comes to high school level going into college level. So for us, we never, you know, we had it for hockey. The guys had it for hockey. I didn't play much hockey. So that wasn't my shtick, but we, we didn't, we don't have what America has in that sense. And to hear what it took, because I can't imagine as a mother now sending my 14 year old off to the other side of the world to go to a place that is so drastically different than what I had raised him in and say, you know, you're young. Not only are you young, you're 14 and you're done high school. I mean, most people are starting high school at 14 in North America. And brought to you by Midday Squares. Have you ever tried a Midday Square? They are the first functional chocolate bar and they're making waves. They're vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and non-GMO. They have six grams of protein, four grams of fiber, and omega-3s. Most importantly, they kill hunger, fuel your brain, boost your mood, and all from natural energy. They're everything a chocolate bar isn't and everything a protein bar wishes it was. Use the code KELSEY15 at checkout to get 15% off today. They don't, <laughs> most 14 year olds, my dear, don't know how to cook noodles. Okay. So the fact that you were I, like, I'm I didn't. well, here's the thing though. <laughs> you graduated high school. You had enough intelligence and enough wherewithal to understand yourself enough to go to another country and be able to carry yourself through successfully. And you could have very well left all of those things and said, you know what, this is too difficult. This is not, not the path. This is not what I'm meant to be. I'm, I, you could have went and been a doctor and would have been very successful in that. 
I'm sure. Um, I'm I'm hundred percent sure of it. It seems like anything that you choose to be successful in Fez, you will. And that is like you said, comes on borrowed faith, but I want to acknowledge that because that's something I think, especially in, um, the time frame that we have in this world right now, what it seems like is there needs, I, I personally have borrowed faith recently. I, I borrow a lot of faith recently because things are a struggle and it's like that for um, you know, many different reasons. But when you have someone who is so young that was able to make such life altering decisions at that age and do it with the maturity in which you did doesn't surprise me that you were able to get to where you have, um, because I know what you're 32 now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're only, I think we're only a month off of each other. So it's, I'm technically the old one in the room here. I'll leave oh, it. Oh, wow. I yeah. My elders. Yeah. Damn right. You do son. So <laughs> how, how does somebody go? Okay. You know, to your parents who it's like, if you're not a lawyer or a doctor, you're a failure. So how do you explain it to your parents? Like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go play a sport Ooh, a as question. a career. It's a good question. That was a really, um, it was a really tough conversation to have. Um, Cause you have to understand my coming to America was not just me coming to America. It's my parents pulling together a lot of our family mm-hmm. resources to send this kid out to another country. The idea is you get to go become something and that in, our, in itself is our investment, right? So for me to come halfway through college and say, you know what, being pre-med and being a basketball player is really not working out the way I want it to work out. I'm not doing well in both of them the way that I could be because I can't dedicate the time. There's no, There's not enough time in the day. I can't do the labs. I can't do the schoolwork. The exp- I, I can't get anything done. I can't get my extra work in and basketball. I have to pick one. And at this point, I started to really enjoy the game. And I felt, let me see how far I can take this. I told you at the end of my sophomore year, I was like, man, I'm still, I, I, like the guy whose ass I'm kicking every day in practice, he is really good. Like he's supposed to be an NBA player. If I'm doing that, I have a potential to do something, but I have to put more time in. And so I go, and this is a really a family discussion. It literally is around 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 the table. <laughs> and we're sitting, it's my parents, it's my uncle, it's my grandparents. And the conversation is, this is what I want to do. Like, I, I, I feel like this is a path that I can take. And I gave you the context earlier of them pulling all the resources to send me to America because that was a big investment they made in me. And so... For me to go chase my dreams, like it's not something that you just do lightly. Like you have to make sure that you're really sure this is what you want to do. And they made me make sure. They were like, "Is are you sure? Because you like you can't. There's no going back after this. Like you have to do what you say you're gonna do." I think it being that hard to make those kind of decisions are good for. It's good for us mm-hmm. because when it's that hard you don't quit so easy because the journey is going to be hard. The reason why they tell us to be doctors and lawyers and all, because at the end of the day, like those jobs and those it's it's hard to do that thing It's hard to, but it's, it's pretty set, right? Like when you become a doctor, you're indispensable. You can't like the, they're always going to need doctors. They're always going to need lawyers. They're always going to need engineers to build society. So um, saying, I want to go be an artist or an athlete it's such a it's such a hard journey to get there. Like you have to understand how hard it is. And so is this really what you want to do? It was a conversation that we had. And luckily I had people who believed in my determination. I have family that believed that if I had gotten to that point on my own, that there was probably something in there for me. And so they they trusted me to make the decision to switch. I still had a good, you know, I still graduated with an economics degree, which is something I could have left after my junior year in college, but I couldn't leave without graduating, which is a deal that we all made. So um, I switched my my major so I didn't have to do all the you know, crazy stuff that was associated with being a biology pre-med major in Yeah, that was, you know, my mom actually asked me this question a couple of weeks ago. She was like, well, you know, now that you don't want to play basketball anymore, would you still want to go back to med school? I was like, mom, what the heck? 
<laughs> you're like, I don't need to. You're missing the point, Ma. This is it's, it's not even like a, it's it's a it's a very Nigerian thing to be. I, I told you the academics is is really it's never really been about it. It's never really fully been about the money. It yeah. is in the sense of the fact that like you have the stability, but it's about the prestige that's associated with that degree. Like right. my son is a doctor. <laughs> there is yeah. something about that that is the this is in the Nigerian community is amazing. I mean, I think it's I think it's beautiful either way. I think success is really in the eye of what you define success as, right? I mean, some people define success as being a stay-at-home mom and homeschooling their children because they are they are building the next generation and informing their minds in a way that they find to be um, most beneficial. Some define success as becoming a doctor, a surgeon, and some define success as just being able to get out of bed every day and function. And I think it really depends on the person. But if you come from a culture where <laughs> quite literally everyone around you has a DR or a PhD or a this, I mean, I can see how that could feel um, a little different. But I mean, I guess getting to say your child is an NBA champion is kind of a big deal. Maybe not so much in Nigeria, but I can say the rest <laughs> of the world definitely is. I mean, doctors, there are a lot of them. And you can always make that decision later on down in life. When you're an athlete, you do, it feels like um, being an athlete myself, not getting to quite your level in obviously basketball because I'm five foot tall and no one saw that happening for me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, being married to a, a retired professional athlete and seeing there is really a time frame um, where your body, your mind can really put up with what it takes to become a successful athlete at that level. And you've got time. I mean, you're so young. You could go back to school if you wanted to. You could be a doctor by your 35th birthday. I mean, for God's sakes, you could do it all. Um, it's really about where your passion lies. And I think what's beautiful about your family is them seeing that you felt so passionate and so compelled by something and you were willing to do the work. And I think at the end of the day, coming from a mother's standpoint, if my child felt so driven and so passionate and so willing to do what it takes to get there, you'll have to give them that chance. You just have to. You just never know where a person's star lies, right? As a parent, right. you try to protect your kids as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And part of the protection is, I think, is guarding this light that we all come to the world with, right? Whenever you see that light in your child, your job as a parent is to guard that light. And part of guarding it is also like, like, dude, if the person is really that inspired and really wants to work on something, they, they obviously, this is something that they can do. This is something that they want to do. This is something that they should do in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad has always said to me, and he said this to me when I was really young, he said this, that you really can make a name for yourself doing anything in the world. You can be a driver and be the best driver in the world. Somebody has to drive the president around, right? Mm -hmm. He said this to me at a young age, and it didn't really click till later in my life because part of being a basketball player is you have to be a team player and you have to be the best at your role. <clears throat> and so when I got to play, like it never was about me. Like I love being a team player. I love being a part of a team because um you know, even when I started playing the game in the first place, I really just, I wanted to make friends. Like that was one of my biggest things. And I was really excited because I get to be a part of the community. Moving here as a kid on your own, living with your uncle, it's its really rough. It's, it's kind of sad and lonely a lot of the time. So having a team of people, I think um, the summer team that I would play with, it wasn't very consistent, right? It's different people. I play with different people all the time. When I got to college, that was my first group of like real solid, solid brothers that I had for years and years and years. And so we formed a family over there and I didn't want to leave before my senior year anyway, because I was like, I want us to win something that means something. I want to come back for my senior year and I want to win. And I came back my senior year and off the bat, I was hit with another challenge. I tore my, you know, I landed some wrongly in practice. I tore my knee up. I had a few ligaments torn. I said I was going to miss the year. 
And it just was something like, I don't really know. I don't know if it's God. I don't know what it, whatever it was that guided me to get back on the court, you know, especially after watching my teammates lose. Remember, I was the team captain. And so we were coming into that senior season with so much hype around us. We we're like the number four team in the country. And we had all this hype around all these guys. And we were supposed to be so good. And starting off the season, before the season starts, like a week before, I tear my knee up. And I'm supposed to be the anchor of the team, right? I'm the team captain, all these things. How do you respond to challenges? Like, I I, I don't really know, because now looking back on it, I didn't really sit here and, like, start. Like, I just wanted to be on the court so badly. And how that showed up for me, I'm the team captain. We are winning and losing games. that We're losing games that we're not supposed to lose. Like, what do I do? Like, all right, you know what? So my teammates were about to go on this road trip to go on a tournament. And before they go on this tr on this trip, I was like, man, I don't, like, I want to, I couldn't go because I had this big cast on my leg or whatever, and I had to do PT. But um, I wrote each person on my team a personal letter. I don't know where this came from. It's just something that I, I just, I feel it so deep inside my soul because I was like, I need to, I want to be on the court with these guys, but I can't be with them. I can't even be with them on the trip. So I gave them each something. And it was really letters that said how I felt about them, how much I believed in them. Um, doubt did not play a factor in the way that I saw and I believed in what they could do as a team. It didn't matter what I was, if I was on the court, not on the court, I thought our team was great. And I felt like I needed to tell them that because sometimes we forget. And I did. And for me, I was so like, like people took it. And some people were like texting me, like they were almost in tears because some of the letters were really, really heartfelt. They went to this tournament and they won. And it was such a like, I was so happy. Like I was, I was always crying, I think, because it was, it meant so much to me that right. my team was good. My college coach used to have this quote. He said, it's amazing what can be accomplished when no one cares who gets the glory. And that was just a mentality that I had. And after this, we still had some rough spots. And so that's what drove me. I was like, screw it. I need to get back on the court. Fast forward through this year because we had a great year. I came back. I was working through an injury, but I, you know, I wasn't supposed to be playing, but I said, screw it. I'm playing. I want to play. <laughs> and I got on the court. And I had this big brace on and we started winning games again. And we ended up winning the first SEC championship since 1950 in 2012. What? We beat the undefeated Kentucky team. It was insane, right? I will take this, and I want to kind of I want to rewind a little bit because I want people to understand. Because when you see this championship, I don't ever want you to forget how this story has turned. Because just a few years before that, they told me I wasn't good enough to play in high school. I know it's kind of blowing my mind listening to you right now because I realizing the trajectory that had to have happened for you to become who you are today. And it's nuts. It's it's I don't ever whenever I tell the story, I always tell people whenever I tell my story, you have to add because of God, because it it's mm -hmm. not by my strength at all. I like guess much as I well, some of my strength because I had to choose to be in the right place and I had to work. But man, there's so much that had to happen. I had to be with the right people. I had to do so. But we won a championship. The first in 50 years of my school. Like I still watch it from time to time. And I still have these like these because they say it. They even like the announcer, the first in 50 years, <laughs> you know, and it's like, wow, that kid. And I was a part of this. If I would have given up on my journey. I wouldn't have been able to be a part of this thing, this machine that created something special. Right. I'm going to stop moving so slowly in the story because I feel like there's, there's still a whole lot more to go, but I get drafted after this, I make it to the NBA and, um, Oh, wow. I missed a really cool part of the story. Tell me, go back and tell me. Do you think it, listen, if, if you think this is the only time you're going to be on the show, you're in your mind. So tell me, tell me, please. 
Okay, so um, Kobe Bryant is a huge inspiration for all the players of my generation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he was somebody who developed. He was human. He made mistakes like everybody else. But he developed this personality that was not going to let anything stop him from being as great as he could be. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> for a lot of us, I think that we all start off the journey saying that we want to be great. I don't care what it is that we want to do. We all start off the journey saying, I'm going to be great at this thing. But along the way, things happen in life and you make mistakes. People hurt you. You hurt people. The, the world crumbles and shuts down like 2020. And you forget because you start to survive, right? All you're trying to figure out is like, how can I survive? But you forget about the mission, which is I want to be great. And I think that's the one thing he kind of reminded us of is it doesn't really matter what happens. You can still make that the priority. You can still accomplish the thing. Even under fire, you can do it, right? And so for us young kids, like I watched Kobe. That was the first game I ever went to. Matter of fact, as my uncle was trying to convince me to go play basketball in the initial, in the first place, he took me to a basketball game. It was the Sacramento Kings versus the LA Lakers. And this game, he said, you never know, you know, never know what could happen. Maybe you'll be out here on the court someday. And it's like me telling you as a Canadian, maybe you could be the American president. Like it was improbable in my mind. It just, mm -hmm. it just couldn't, what are you saying? This, uh, it doesn't even make sense. I can't yeah. even dribble a basketball, you know? <laughs> and it's funny because I told you, you have to believe in other people's belief in you full circle. Fast forward. I get drafted into the NBA. My first game in the NBA <laughs> is against the Los Angeles Lakers. Oh, oh my gosh. And Kobe Bryant is right there standing in front of me with a hand like this. But the game is about to start. And I'm like almost frozen. Like, I don't even know what's like, wow. it's a, is this a dream? Am I dreaming? Is this like, and um, we played that game. The year before, the year before I got drafted, the team I got drafted to, the Golden State Warriors, were the worst team in the NBA. Um. I get drafted in 2012. We start off on this mission. We're young guys. We say, we want to go win an NBA championship. <laughs> People are like, yo, you guys are stupid. You're actually insane. <laughs> Do you understand? First of all, you guys are all young. So you don't know shit. You don't know anything. I'm trying not to cuss on your podcast. It's okay. People um, cuss on my podcast. And I do 20 times worse than you, sweetheart. Don't worry. So they're, they're like, yo, you just don't, you don't understand what it takes to win. Let me tell you all the reason why. Why? See, this is my mom used to say, my mom says all the time, you kind of have to be, it's actually okay to be young and stupid sometimes because that's mm -hmm. the thing that makes you dream these big dreams, right? That's true. Because experience tells you what you can't do. And so people would tell us, wow, you guys are too young. You don't understand that this has to happen. This has to happen. Like, yo, we want to go win a championship. So <laughs> whatever has to happen, we're going to go win a championship. And so we hit our first hurdle my my rookie year so we go play the season we beat kobe bryant the first game of the season and so we have this confidence about us so we're like the new shiny thing in town right so we're doing these things we're winning games and we end up winning like 55 games out of 82 and so that was pretty good for us so we get to the playoffs we're playing against one of the number one home teams in the league in the playoffs first round and i remember this very vividly because they have all these analysts the job I'm doing now, kind of funny. Um, <laughs> all these analysts talking and predicting what the series was going to be. And nobody chose us to win. None of wow. them. They were, the most they gave us, because in the series of seven, the most somebody gave us was they will lose in six. We beat them in six. You know? What? It's insane. Because you don't understand... After this, we deal with some challenges. A lot of people get hurt because we just don't understand what it takes. The next year after that, I had an, the injury. I got I re-injured my leg. I missed the following year. The third year, I come back. I come back actually on my birthday, October 21st. 
Coach Kerr, Steve Kerr comes in and he says, Festus, I know what we're going to give you for your birthday today. For your birthday, you're going to play tonight. And we're all, you know, my team <laughs> yeah. was, was amazing. Yeah, we're all jumping around. I played that game. It was amazing. And um, so we go through the year. And I come back, and this is my first time back, you know, after a year. And there's so much me trying to learn the game again and be around the guys. And, man, it was so amazing to play this game again. And I realized, you know, I freaking love this game. Right. Because I'm alive now and all the things, all the hard work you go through in rehab, because you you hit these, you keep hitting these walls. Right. And then you get on the other side of them because of missing a whole year of basketball is freaking insane. Mm -hmm. You're there every day. You're watching everybody else play. And I told you, I hate losing. So we would lose some games. I'm like, oh, my God. And it doesn't <laughs> help because the reporters are also saying, well, if you have Festus here, you could have been doing this, man. Anyway. Full circle, we go on to the third year, and I'm back finally after all these years and after all this all this time. I mean, and I'm back on the court, and we start, you know, winning games. Steph Curry is doing Steph Curry stuff. Clay Thompson is doing Clay Thompson things. Draymond Green is amazing. Now we came in at the same time, came in to the league at the same the same year, the same draft, and this team is just rolling. It just fast forward, you know, we end up going. And we play in the, you know, play in the tournament and the playoffs and we just keep winning and keep winning and keep winning. And we get to the finals and we're looking at each other like, yo, what? are we really here? <laughs> like, really, we're in the finals, you know, and we just keep, we just keep going. And at some point we win an NBA championship. And. Like I, I'll tell you this, there's there's a few moments in my life that I think are the most amazing things in my life, right? I think getting on that plane to come to America was one of the most amazing things that has ever happened in my life. Um, winning an NBA championship? When I grew up, I used to believe that, I believed when I grew up that championships were for other people. I thought that I never thought it was for me. I thought that like, yeah, this, the people who win are the people who win. Mm -hmm. When I won a championship, it really more than anything is possible. It just made me realize what it looks like to give a kid a chance. Like, that's all it was, is I just had an opportunity. I had a man who put his arm around me in a time when I could have really just given up and said, I don't want to do this anymore. And so when we won, all these things, like, it, it, like people can't even imagine. Like, you don't, like, you win and you start thinking about the journey. You start thinking, that, like, where did I, like, they told me I couldn't play in high school. I got to college. I was a practice player. And I got to the NBA. We were the worst team in the NBA. What what just happened? <laughs> right? That's us. You have no idea what you can accomplish. Yeah, that's my story. Home fest. Listen, listen. I've talked to a lot of people in my day, but that's, this is something different. I think we have this perception or we put this on ourselves, whether it's our parents or our society or whatever that, like you said, championships, success, Oscars, uh, Pulitzer prizes, whatever, Olympic gold medals, they're not for us. They're for those people but we are those people. You can choose to be those people. We need to start believing that we can be those people and that it is accessible to anybody. Most of the time, we just need to be given the opportunity. And I think that's what's the most beautiful thing about your story is your parents didn't put fear into you. They, they put 
adventure into you. They put belief into you. They put God into you. And because of that, somebody crossed paths with you just because you should have been training, but instead you're sitting on a bus stop, like you're just sitting there hanging out. That person was supposed to cross paths with you. That was the moment for you. If I look back at your lineage and your timeline and go, that was your moment. That was the moment. Not the moment that the NBA saw potential, not the moment that the college saw potential. That was your moment. That was the moment. That was the fork in the road. That was the turning point for you. And that guy deserves a massive amount of credit. And I'm sure, I'm sure you've said it to him since. I mean, that guy was, he was your Northern star without re even realizing it. Like you said, we look back on these journeys and there's like this romanticizing, you know, the journey, the, <clears throat> the things that we do and, you know, it's hard and we talk about the difficulty of it, but when you're in it, the difference between somebody becoming an NBA champion and a high school college or a high school or a college basketball coach is that you believed in yourself and you were willing to do the work yourself. Nobody could do that for you. Nobody could implement those tools and teach you how to run and shoot and, and not score on your own net. Like nobody could do that for you, but you. And that right there is a special thing. And I think it's a story to be, I believe your story should be, I mean, more people need to know about it. If, if younger kids could see what you had to go through to become who you are today, I think they wouldn't complain so much. I think that they would be like, oh, wait, I have access to all of these things. All I have to do is try. Shit, I can do this. I can do this because he could do this when he had no other option, when he couldn't dribble a ball, when he wasn't even in America to have access to what I have now. I wish more people could appreciate what they have and see and put the effort in that you put in. You're 32 years old. You're one of the most successful people I know in sports. But not only that is you're one of the most successful people in life. Because you don't just look at basketball as everything to you. You have faith, you have growth, you have other things than just that. I see so many NFL players, NBA players, NHL players who, when they leave the sport or super cross racers, this is something in my husband's industry that's really prevalent. When you stop playing and you stop being that guy, who are you outside of that? So I think that's one of my last questions to you, Fez, is who are you outside of basketball? You guys see this, there's a sign right here that says rebuilding the beast. Well, I was lucky to have your host, Kels, really um, grace my podcast with her presence. And the idea is um, we are constantly rebuilding right in in our journeys there's never a point you get to where you feel like oh now i've made it now i don't have to do anything else right you're always constantly balancing you're always constantly working evolving transforming whatever it is dealing with challenges and rebuilding so you've heard my story you understand that i've had to rebuild the beast over and over and over i'm still rebuilding right now and so leaving the game was probably one of the hardest things i've ever had to do in my life and you ask the question, who are you? Part of playing professional sports or doing anything at a very high level, you have to lose yourself in the process. That means that you have to really dedicate your life, your, your energy, your time, your just your resources towards this thing, this goal. That's the way you become great at it. And some way, sometimes you lose your identity in it. When I left basketball a few years ago, I had an injury that took me away from the game. And I tried to figure it out. Who am I? I worked so hard to get back on the court, which I did last year. And it was an, a Herculean feat to get back on the court. A lot of surgeries, a lot of pain, a lot of almost died. Um, was in a wheelchair for six months, just a lot of things. And so I've had to, even after the successes, rebuild the beast again physically mentally my identity wise 
And so now when you ask me the question, now I have the benefit of hindsight because I've dealt with rebuilding and moving to a new country, having no hope, right? So at this point in my life, um, there's so much, there's, there's so much, like even telling the story in the first place is for a reason. So other people, kids, adults, doesn't matter who it is, listen to this podcast, they can hear this and understand that their own light is important and they, they need to guard it, right? That's why I tell the story in whatever form I do, whether it's doing the job I do now, talk, talking about sports on TV, I still throw things like this in there so people can understand that sports is a metaphor for life, right? That's the reason why people watch it so much and it's such a big thing because it's a, a way for us to escape life a little bit, but it is the metaphor. We can go there and learn something from other people, people who are doing it so greatly. Um, so for me, I am, I'm a lot of things. I'm not one thing I, as one thing. I've, that's the thing I've learned rather. So, so right now I am learning to flow with life. I have worked hard for the last few years trying to figure out what else I like to do. After basketball went away, I, I it was a really hard transition for me because I had dedicated so much and I still felt like there was so much for me to do there. But sometimes when the doors close, we beat it down and we're like, man, like, why can't like open the door, open the door, open the door. An analogy my mom gave me is just walk up the hall. There's more doors. <laughs> There's just <laughs> other know? doors. There's other doors. And we're so focused on this one door. So for me, the last couple of years has been discovering new doors. Um, I've run a podcast. It's called Rebuilding the Beast. Like I said, your host was on there. Um, but I, you know, I do a broadcasting job for the team I played for. I work for the team um, as a sports analyst. I'm an investor in different brands and um, I am, uh, I guess in the next case, I'm an influencer in those cases, uh, run a few different businesses as well. Uh, my family owns a couple of schools uh, that we run. That is our thing that we give in the world. Um, restaurants. It's there's, there's a lot of things that uh, I've been able to uh be a part of when I started to realize that there's more I could do. And that's for all of us. I don't care what it is that you have accomplished. I don't care what it is, wherever you came from. There is so much that you can do. And the people who are doing amazing things in the world, there is nothing that's that special about them that you can't find in yourself. They either had the opportunity or they either had the opportunity to do the thing um, or they just really believed and figure out a way to break down whatever wall was standing in their way. So that is just my message, my message about who I, who I've been. I'm still discovering what more of myself that I have inside of me through this journey. Like I said, I just have the benefit of hindsight that shows me that I can do a lot of things. So actually, before I even end that, my name, my name is Ifani Festus Izili. And Ifani, which is my first name, it means nothing is impossible with God. And they've given me this track since I was born. That's where I came from. And that's why my story is the way it is. So their names matter as well. Jeez, man leaving me with all the feels leaving us with all the feels but yeah you are um you do have the benefit of hindsight but i will say um i have a feeling this is really just the beginning for you you are an innovator you're a man of faith but you're a leader more than anything and people like you you don't just lead people will follow people like you they will hear this. They will see something in themselves that they never saw before. And from this, and I am proud to say it, this will change some people's lives. 
And it has been an honor to have you on. And I cannot wait to have you on again because I want to hear about every other thing that has gone <laughs> on in the past year and since the little bit that we met because it has been already a bunch of stuff. So thank you so much for coming on, Fezzi. It has been an honor. And um, can you give everyone your social handles and anywhere else people can find any of the great things you're doing? Uh, social handles. Um, I am at Fezzy Fell on Instagram. F E Z Z Y F E L. Don't ask me why it's somebody <laughs> created that name years ago and it's stuck. So Fezzy Fell, I think Festus Azili on Twitter and everything else. It, those are really my main, my main thing. So, um, rebuilding the beast actually what am i doing yeah rebuilding the beast is my baby and it's a page on instagram where we tell stories of amazing people like kelsey and um man you guys really like as much as i i think that you know my story is amazing there are so many people who have had a lot of challenges in their lives and are doing incredible things with their stories and I think that everybody deserves to read something, read, read these stories because you will be inspired. I am inspired every day by these amazing people. So uh, at Rebuilding the Beast is the page on Instagram. You guys go check it out. We will make sure to do that. We'll put everything in the bio and uh, everyone else. We'll see you all next week.